Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Sean Andrew Wimpy and I'm an assistant professor here at California State University Bakersfield in the Department of History. Uh, my first research book, which is coming out in 2019, covered the topic of Germany, um, the League of Nations, and the Mandate System, which is what I will be talking about today as one of the major impacts and effects of the First World War and the peace settlement that followed. World War I ended with the armistice in 1918 on the 11th hour of the 11th day of 1918, but the conflict was far from over. The peace settlement had yet to be concluded, and that would take a six-month process, but really spans the better part of a year. It began on the 18th of January 1919 with the Paris Peace Conference. Even though the Treaty of Versailles is the most famous treaty to come out of the Paris Peace Conference and the negotiations that occurred there, it is not the only treaty to settle border disputes and territorial claims as well as resolving conflicts from the First World War. There are a series of several treaties. The first treaty, the Treaty of Versailles, takes six months on its own to negotiate, and this stipulates Germany's unconditional surrender in the conflict, the infamous reparations payments, as well as beginning the process of convening what will become the League of Nations, establishing the League of Nations Covenant, which I will talk about more later. However, the new borders and new countries that will emerge from the First World War, also discussed later in this presentation, are decided much more effectively during the Treaty of St. Germain in September of 1919, the Treaty of Neuilly in November of 1919, the Treaty of Trianon in June of 1920, and the Treaty of Sèvres, which dealt with the Ottoman Empire and its loss of territory in August 1920. The whole process is not technically concluded until the 21st of January 1920 at the inaugural ceremony of the League of Nations. The process of dissolving four empires after the First World War, however, began long before the peace negotiations started, with President Woodrow Wilson's speech to Congress in February of 1918, not long after the United States has joined the conflict in 1917. Wilson forwarded that America's goal, it, one of its many goals in the war, would be to preserve the concept of self-determination for nation states. This concept had been around for a century or more as nationalism was on the rise in Europe, but here he is stating it as a decree of international law, and it's going to be a guiding principle of how Woodrow Wilson approaches the peace settlement at Versailles, and as a result, will impact the negotiations hitherto for. Self-determination is going to be part of what dissolves two of the four empires that we'll look at dissolving today as a result of the peace settlement. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is one of the large Central European empires which will face dissolvement after dissolution after the First World War. It will be carved up into several territories, including the new nation states of Czechoslovakia. Parts of it are going to go to Poland, Austria, Italy will receive a component, the new nation state of Hungary. The state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs will be formed, as well as a significant chunk of territory ceded to Romania. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, which had been ruled by the Habsburgs for several centuries prior to this point, is now effectively over and is now charting its own path as multiple different nation states thanks to the concept of self-determination. However, each nationality, supposedly lining up with the borders of each new state, is not as smooth a transition as the conveners of the peace would hope. As different ethnicities from various communities had interspersed throughout the Austro-Hungarian Empire throughout its entire history, the new territory of Poland, for instance, will have several ethnic Germans and Czechs and Slovaks within its border. The new state of Romania will have several Maiars and Slovats and Croats and Serbs and even Germans. So these territories do not line up with ethnicity as Wilson's statement of self-determination would have them do so, and that will be part of what is the lasting legacy of the First World War as this will lead to ethnic conflict in the Second World War and beyond.
The second empire dissolved by self-determination had already begun its process of dissolution as a result of a revolution, Tsarist Russia. Tsarist Russia will undergo a revolution in 1917 led by the Bolsheviks and Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. That will begin a process of the Soviet Union forming out of the remnants of Tsarist Russia. As the revolution had occurred during the war itself, the new Bolshevik government that had declared itself as the sole legitimate government of Russia faced civil war and also a global conflict at the same time. Loyalists to the Tsar advocated for a restoration of the Tsar's family, even though the Tsar and his immediate family had been murdered, a restitution of the Romanov line to the throne and a civil war began that would last until 1922. Faced with this conflict internally, and also faced with World War I and a German army on its western border that was increasingly successful, the new Bolshevik government actually surrenders to Germany on the eastern front in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk on the 3rd of March, 1918. In this treaty, they cede massive amounts of their western territory to the German government as part of a peace settlement and a surrender in order for Russia to exit the conflict and no longer engage in hostilities with Germany. After the war concludes, even though Tsarist Russia had been a member of the Allied Powers during the First World War, the Allied Powers do not recognize the new Bolshevik government. They do not acknowledge the legitimacy of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, so Germany is not allowed to keep these new concessions, these territories, from the Bolshevik government. However, these territories will not be returned to Russia either um, under the new communist government that has formed. As a result, five new nation states will be formed under the concept of self-determination carved out of a majority of this territory that had been ceded during the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Following the same pattern that we had seen under the Austro-Hungarian Empire, these states do not necessarily cleanly line up with ethnicities, even though supposedly Estonia, Lithuania, Pol large chunks of Poland and Ukraine are intended to. The last two empires do not face as many challenges from the concept of self-determination and are actually facing problems for their extensive imperial holdings and will be dissolved in a new way, creating eventually the mandate system. Those two empires are the Ottoman Empire, which had ruled over much of the Arabian Peninsula, large chunks of southeastern Europe, and throughout its history, large pieces of North Africa, though that had mostly dissolved by the time we enter the First World War. Instead of being treated as an equal power and being able to maintain itself, this territory will also be broken up, but not along the lines of self-determination. Some countries will be allowed to go their own way, such as the Kingdom of Najed and eventually the Republic of Turkey formed out of the capital components of the Ottoman Empire. However, other territories such as Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Transjordan, and Palestine will be formed into mandates under the League of Nations. The reason for the formation of mandates out of Ottoman territory, however, has much more to do with their ally, Germany. The German Empire, which had been identified during the Treaty of Versailles as the main aggressor of the war, despite the fact that Austria-Hungary began the conflict after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, faces yet another penalty in the wake of the Treaty of Versailles. At the conclusion of the First World War, Germany had been the third largest overseas empire in the world, surpassed only by the British Empire and the French Overseas Empire. During its reign as an imperial power, which began in 1884 and is effectively over by 1919, Germany's colonial empire faced numerous charges of exception, exceptional colonial brutality, especially during matters of colonial guilt, which will be a term used during the interwar period, related to the 1904 to 1907 conflict in what was then German Southwest Africa and is now present day Namibia in which the German military commanders in the area committed a genocide against the Herero Anama groups in Africa.
This conflict had resulted in propaganda during the First World War that Germany should not be allowed to retain its empire after the conflict. Propaganda had been circulated by the Allied powers to other African groups within Germany's empire as well, as this was truly a global war, and promises were made for independence or at least liberation from German colonial oppression. After the war concludes, the Allies are faced with a challenge. What to do with Germany's overseas holdings, and as a result, also its ally, the Ottoman Empire's holdings in the Arabian Peninsula. The main debate comes between whether or not the Allied powers who have been victorious in the conflict will annex Germany's colonies, or if, as they had promised in some of the wartime propaganda, they will liberate them as independent states. Several within the British and French empires do not favor the concept of liberation of African and Pacific Islander colonies. They are very wedded to the idea of the civilizing mission and Europe's right to rule as various imperial powers over the rest of the planet. Additionally, it would not look proper for the enemy's colonies, including African soldiers who had fought on behalf of Germany in a long drawn out campaign in East Africa to achieve independence when colonial troops from South Asia, East Asia, the Pacific, and Africa, who had fought for Britain and France, were not achieving colonial independence, even though they were part of the victorious side of the war. Additionally, Woodrow Wilson throws a wrench into the mix again. He had blamed, much like Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the war on Europe's expansionist imperial aims, and that this had ultimately led to conflict and the First World War, which had dragged the United States into the conflict as a result. In his same speech where he states the concept of self-determination, he also states that there will be no annexations and that the United States will not tolerate the concept of imperial expansion as a spoil of the war. A compromise, therefore, needs to be reached. As a result of an agreement that had already been in process through the negotiations of a British diplomat, Alfred Zimmern, and a South African general of Boer descent, Jan Smuts. Both of these individuals had been instrumental in helping to craft a new peace organization that would be created within the Treaty of Versailles. This League of Nations would help prevent war by mediating disputes. In order to address Wilson's concerns about annexation, Zimmern and Smuts, more effectively Smuts, proposes the idea that instead of either the Allied powers annexing Germany's former colonies or the colonies going independent, which might create a wave of colonial revolt movements against the British and the French as well as enemy colonies become independent, Smuts proposes a sort of training wheel period in which these territories will be tutored towards democratic self-rule with oversight by an international body, the League of Nations. He proposes that the League of Nations form what will be called a mandate system, in which each of these colonies will be awarded to a mandatory power which will administer these territories on behalf of the League of Nations until such time as they are ready for democratic self-rule and independence. There will be, however, international oversight for these territories. The League of Nations mandate system is established within Article 22 of the Treaty of Versailles, along with the entire League of Nations covenant, which is also a component of the Treaty of Versailles. This one article establishes the entire framework for this very complex system of internationalist imperialism, whereby we will have responsible imperialism is the goal that is actually engaging in the civilizing mission. Smuts and others, however, regarded this mandate system as merely a band-aid, a papering over of annexationist tendencies. And we can see that in the text of the document, especially in Article 22. If we look at the third to last paragraph in which territories will be treated basically as extensions of the mandatory power to which they are awarded, this is a specific subset of mandates, which I will discuss in a moment. However, international oversight will be provided for in the form of yearly reports to a League Commission, which will become known as the Permanent Mandates Commission, 
which will hold multiple members from various states, both those that hold mandates on behalf of the League of Nations, as well as several who will not over the tenure of the League of Nations, effectively until 1945, but pragmatically concluding at the outset of the Second World War. The mandatory powers who are supposedly going to administering these territories on behalf of the League of Nations and submitting annual reports to the League of Nations for review on their progress towards tutoring these territories toward democratic self-rule are Britain, France, Belgium, Japan, who had been an allied power during the First World War and is the only non-European state to get a mandate as a result of this agreement, as well as the British dominions of the Union of South Africa, the Dominion of Australia, and the Dominion of New Zealand. Britain, France, and Belgium will all acquire mandates comprised of German territories in Africa, as well as Ottoman holdings for Britain and France on the Arabian Peninsula. The Union of South Africa will acquire the German colony of Southwest Africa as a mandate. Australia, New Zealand, and Japan will divide between the three of them Germany's Pacific colonies to administer as mandates. The mandates will be further broken down into three classes of mandates, Class A, Class B, and Class C. The classes indicate how close the Allied powers and the conveners of the treaty believe these territories to be towards democratic self-rule. The former Ottoman holdings, which are included as a result of oil discoveries and also a desire to punitively punish the Ottoman Empire, but not willing to go the full step of allowing for self-determination of a non-European group, will be regarded as Class A mandates. The Class A mandates are regarded as being the closest to democratic self-rule, and in theory will have the largest amount of international oversight from the Permanent Mandates Commission, supposedly with inspections. In practice, however, this will not be the case. In fact, the Class A mandates will under will see the greatest levels of imperial violence at the hands of British and French imperializers in the region. As far as the B class mandates, most of these will be in sub-Saharan Africa, comprising German Cameroon, German Togo, and German East Africa, each of which will be broken into two colonies. These are deemed much further removed from civilization due to European prejudices against Africans in this period, and these territories will be given a fair degree of latitude within this system by the mandatory powers to exploit them for resources so long as all League member states are allowed to exploit them equally. The last group, the C-class mandates, will be re regarded as annexation in all but name. These territories are regarded to have scant or sparse populations, which is entirely a myth concocted by the Allied powers which are receiving these territories. The reason Japan and the dominions of the British Empire, the Union of South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand receive Class C mandates is as a reward for their service in the First World War, and no one wants to agitate them. Japan's naval strength is on the rise, so the Allied powers want to keep Japan appeased for the time being, and Britain does not want to risk the dominions of South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand breaking away from the British Empire due to losses from the First World War and frustration at British mismanagement. So they are awarded territories over which they have effective control. This, however, will not proceed as planned as there will be numerous League challenges to treating these like annexed territories, as the Permanent Mandates Commission does occasionally assert its power instead of just being a rubber stamp policy organization. This all brings us back to the concept of self-determination as proposed to be part of the agreements by Wilson. This leads us to question who he really meant to receive self-determination as a result of the negotiations. Wilson primarily, being of European descent, regards only Europeans and Americans to have the concept of nationalism and therefore only they are capable of forming nation states. He has a fair degree of racism towards Africans, Asians, Native Americans, and those of Arabic descent in this period, and should be regarded not as an ally of them, but as an opponent in many ways. However, 
Many of these territories are going to hear Wilson's speech and assume that he also meant to include them. Groups such as African Americans in the United States, Indians in the British colony there, as well as Chinese citizens that are under various states' rule, Koreans as well facing Japanese occupation in part of their territory early on and effectively much more so later on are going to be clamoring for the concept of self-determination. This will help form several colonial nationalist independence movements in this period, as this is viewed as a possible way in order to gain legitimacy for an independence movement and receive recognition from European and Western powers. As we can see in this propaganda poster from 1919, which is now currently housed in the British Library, the defeated Germans are very quick to point out the hypocrisy of the entire concept of self-determination. In addition to being deprived of their own territories in Europe as part of their country is carved off to form the new countries of Poland and Czechoslovakia, along with a sizable portion of ethnic Germans living in those territories, they critique that as not being effective self-determination. They also point out that if the Entente, the Allied powers, were in earnest about the concept of self-determination, they would loosen the reins of their entire imperial holdings and let all of these nations that they have imperialized and colonized become independent. The Germans are not advocating this, but are merely pointing out the hypocrisy of the system and want the mandate system to be truly stating what it is intentionally doing, which is preserving empire as long as possible in the wake of the First World War when cracks are starting to emerge. The Germans in this period are merely seeking to reclaim um, their colonial holdings, but also want to be respected as a member of the, quote, civilized world, which is a charge that has been lost as a result of accusations of excessive colonial brutality and them being deemed unfit imperialists. Germany will be seeking a mandate or be seeking the destruction of the League of Nations and the mandate system intermittently throughout the 1920s and 30s, vacillating between these two strategies throughout. Much of this German engagement is coming from what could be called colonial Germans themselves. So these are individuals who had been settlers or administrators in the German colonies during its 30 year period of effective imperialism. Governors like Heinrich Schnee or Theodor Seitz are very quick to pounce on the notion of Germany's unfit imperialism and point out that all imperial powers have such quote, dark blots in their history, end quote pointing to atrocities by the French in Algeria and the British during the Sepoy Mutiny in India. They also point to repeated atrocities committed by the French and the British in the mandates of Syria and Iraq during the mandatory period in the 1920s. They are constantly calling into question the entire rhetorical strategy of the League of Nations, that it is making the world safe for democracy and tutoring these territories towards democratic self-rule, and are pointing out that this is merely imperialism and that if we are actually seeking to reform imperialism, shouldn't Germany be part of the negotiation and at this conference, at this settlement, on a regular basis throughout the 1920s to determine the fate of mandates and their foreign colonies. Again, this is a rhetorical device, but they are starting to engage much more effectively with internationalism and actually starting to believe in the concept of internationalism as a means to achieve their goals. Contrary to what much scholarship says on Germany during this period, that it becomes increasingly nationalist and isolationist in this period. Imperialism and internationalism very much work together and the Germans see that and hope to reclaim their empire through these mechanisms, through the League of Nations mandate system in particular. Evidence of Germany's involvement in internationalism can be seen after Locarno, the Locarno peace treaties in 1925, which are meant to undo some of the bad blood from the Treaty of Versailles and the subsequent treaties settling the First World War. Germany joins the League of Nations in 1926 and gets a member on the Permanent Mandates Commission effectively overseeing how the British, the French, the Belgians, the Japanese, the South Africans, the Australians, and the New Zealanders are administering their former colonies um, and will serve as a member of the League of Nations until they withdraw um, in the 1930s under Hitler's Nazi regime. 
Heinrich Schnee, who is a fierce critic of the League of Nations and the last governor of Germany, East Africa, will actually serve on the League of Nations Manchurian Commission after Japan invades China in the early 1930s, serving as one of the League's representatives and actually a moderate voice on the commission to determine whether or not Japan engaged in aggressive expansionist imperialism and what the League's decision and response should be on the matter. The loss of Germany's colonies will continue to have an impact in German politics and will be appropriated as a goal of the Nazi party for a brief time. Hitler and the Nazis are not as serious about overseas imperial expansion as they are about continental expansion into Eastern, Southern, and Western Europe in this period. However, they will make nods to it in their propaganda, as we can see in these three propaganda posters meant to instill patriotism for a Germany that once was and a lost entity. Colonial Germans, many of which will join the Nazi party, wind up becoming disenchanted with the Nazi party as not adhering to their vision of imperialism or their specific subset of racist policies, as both groups are incredibly racist but have a different view on what racism means in this period. And so some will actually start to act as spies like Ludwig Kassel against the Nazis during this period. Um, some will have joined the Nazi party and then will seek to undergo denazification such as Heinrich Schnee after the war in order to participate in other imperial projects after the war concludes. They are mostly concerned with just preserving their imperial careers at any cost, and if the Nazis achieve that, so be it. If internationalism achieves it, so be it. But it will be a long-running thread throughout German politics in the early 20th century. Even though the stated goal of the mandate system had been tutelage towards democratic self-rule and eventual independence for these various territories that had been Ottoman holdings and former German colonies, only one country in the entire tenure of the League of Nations will undergo the process of terminating the mandate, in a sense, becoming an independent country. That will be Iraq in 1932. As a result of numerous finagled negotiations about oil and the nature of oil in Iraq and rights to oil and League of Nations member states getting fair and equal access to it, as well as a host of problems with revolt and increasing cost, Britain proposes termination of the mandate in 1930. This results in a two-year debate within the Permanent Mandates Commission about whether or not Iraq will be allowed to become independent and if it is ready. It is eventually voted on unanimously that Iraq will be granted independence so long as it joins the League of Nations and subscribes to minority protections within the League of Nations and agrees to sell oil at an equal and fair price to many member states. Iraqis, however, are not allowed to pick their own monarch. The monarch is handpicked by the British. He is a member of the Hashemite family, which still currently rules Jordan today. King Faisal I of Iraq is an exceptionally paranoid ruler and does engage in a number of massacres during his brief tenure as the king of Iraq, which lasts only a year before he dies. He is increasingly concerned about Assyrians, um, in the northern, Assyrians and Kurds in the northern part of Iraq that might be fomenting rebellion, as they had repeatedly requested to the League of Nations and the Permanent Mandates Commission that they be granted their own nation state and self-determination during the 1920s and 30s. All of this through a series of intrigues and misunderstandings will result in the Samil massacre in which several villages are massacred by Faisal's Iraqi military in 1933. This will have long-running reverberations on whether or not mandates can be terminated and will lead to European powers viewing colonies as not ready for independence on a regular basis, using the excuse of Samil as an example of atrocities that occur when an, a colony becomes independent. The League of Nations mandate system should be dissolved after the dissolution of the League of Nations in 1945 when that entity is deemed to have been a failure having not succeeded in preventing the Second World War through mediation of disputes. However, the mandate system does not disappear. Although several of the Middle Eastern mandates will be granted independence, including the Mandate of Palestine by 1948, 
creating a whole wave of debates about Israeli-Palestinian conflicts, which can be discussed in another segment, hopefully, in a future gallery segment for the library. Many of the mandates in the African territories, as well as in the Pacific and newly acquired territories that had been part of Japan's expansion during the Second World War, will instead be rolled over into a new entity, the United Nations Trust System. The United Nations Trust System, established in Chapter 12 of the UN Charter and Article 77 of that charter, will create essentially a system that is identical to the mandate system, however, with much more effective international oversight. This, again, preserves the concept of empire, justifying it as, well, if empire can be done right and properly with humanitarian goals in mind, without being called empire, but developmentalist in nature, perhaps we can keep this concept alive longer and maybe stave off some of the post-colonial revolts that are, I mean, the colonial revolts and independence movements that are starting to emerge with greater frequency after the Second World War. The UN trust system will be in place until 1994, when the last UN trust territory is granted independence, which is a small Pacific territory the islands of Palau, which are granted independence in 1994, effectively terminating the UN um, trust system. From this, we can see that the First World War and the negotiations and institutions and systems that come out of it have a long-running impact on the 20th century, with reverberations echoing well into the 1990s.